I'm Mark Wybrow and this is a very special Electronic Cafe, the channel for the lovers of electronic music. And I'm Andy McNabb, so let's get started. So welcome to this, the latest edition of the Electronic Cafe. Uh, you're going to see the second part of our amazing interview with the uh, Tiny Magnetic Pets. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed our time with the guys. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm sure you saw that in part one. It certainly continues in part two. So again, thank you, Paula, Sean and Eugene for such an amazing time Mark and I had. We've also got our Hot Stuff section. We'll be looking at some great uh, new albums. I've got two absolute crackers that you absolutely need to hear about. So um, stay tuned for that. I'm sure Mark will have two amazing good albums for you as well. So sit back and enjoy um, the second part of our amazing interview with the brilliant Tiny Magnetic Pets. Desert uh, Island Disc. You're on a desert island with one album. Um, I know it's difficult because there's so much stuff we yeah, love. But... If I'm stuck on an island, I need something that's kind of... I think I've, I've said it before in an interview. I do love live and Berlin soundtrack, which is Depeche Mode's live album. Mm. I just think, God, the energy in that album, and then there's also the other, the mellow side of it. So yeah, that's a bit of everything on that, you know. I can They're be on, on my own. <laughs> <laughs> They're amazing band. I mean, I, 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 me and Mark live in Essex, so we literally grew up with those boys um, and saw them playing little bars, venues. Just amazing. Yeah, in fact, Fletch asked one of my then girlfriends out, and she stupidly said no. I'm with him. I thought, what a mug. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Quite claim to fame, but yeah, we literally used to hang around and see him everywhere. And then I saw the last Vince Clark one they did at the Lyceum uh, with Blamond supporting. So yeah, all great memories. But you see them now, and they're just this massive band. And just, they are great. I think I think synth bands with a female singer. I mean, like I'm I'm in a synth band with a female singer, but I I really like that look and setup with a female singer. Whether it goes from you know Debbie Harry or Churches or whatever, I really like that. Yeah. I really I really like that female singer aesthetic. Well, I think, it, I think it works really good. Yeah, Fantagram, School of Seven Bells. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like oh, School of Seven Bells. I saw them twice. Uh, <gasps> yeah. Tragic what happened there. Yeah, very. That very was sad. sad. Yeah, very I sad. Because they I, could put out all their stuff again and they'd be like, well, obviously, given what's happened. But, I mean, I don't think that many people are too aware of them. I think they're No, we amazing. did a show on them for that reason because I, I, I just thought they were one of those bands that didn't make a bad track that... I saw no, them. They're a little hidden secret, aren't they? I mean, I listen to them. Yeah. Like, Sean, you're not too mad enough. I've said it quite a few times. Stuff. So I'm like, mm, I absolutely. Yeah, it's. I mean, I, I kind of like it. I kind of, but I don't know if I if I don't buy it, it's a bit kind of too. Listen to the vocal melody. There's so many unusual changes. They do not go the way you expect. You know, the yeah. go way. And as a singer, I I just think. The voices are incredible and the changes and the key changes and um yeah it's probably a little bit perfectly produced for sean i would think but i, I think yeah I that, last, that last album i find really 
brilliant as it is. It's hard to listen to because you know the backstory behind it and, you know, you read into the lyrics and stuff and it's just heartbreaking. It's like, it's a beautiful album, but it's just heartbreaking. So, oh. sure, sure, not, sure, not go a little bit of fanboy, okay? Um, when, you're, when you're writing, have you got, like, go-to simps that you use on all your stuff or do you use software simps a lot or what's your... Uh-huh. You are 77. That's on the that comes off a lot. Seven is a, What's your weapon of choice? Depends. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't get... Um, the only kind of uh, synth that I've got any kind of emotional attachment to is uh, my Moog Prodigy. Um, so I've been using a lot of really old kind of synths. There's nothing really kind of fancy about them or anything. Like on, on Blue Wave, I have... Um, <laughs> Welcome back. I have um, a Kawai um, K4R, yeah. which uh, it's been land gathering dust for about 10 years. Um, I hadn't used it and I thought I'd take it out and just have a listen of singing about maybe get rid of it. And no, and, no, no, no. <laughs> no, I mean, this is the thing. I end up doing um, the City Sleeps um, with it and uh, Broken Record. Broke, I love I love broken records. Yeah. Uh, uh, the first time I played the album, my wife was in the kitchen cooking, and it was on like the Sonos was on, and there were some chord changes in that. With uh, that, everyone just my, my my wife's a musician as well, and everyone just stopped and just thought, "This is incredible. I love that song. That's a great song. Love lyrics in that song. Yeah, they, it's it's good good right. song. Oh, thank you. thank you. I just use so I don't Eugene use I use um Arturia and I've the micro labs, so I would write most of Paul and Eugene, um they, they would use kind of more software uh, based things, but yeah. they would use um but they'd be like a ARP Odyssey, um Selena Springs, uh, that sort of Mellotron, that that sort of thing. But as far as um Moog Prodigy, uh, Moog Little Fatty, um, sure. used it quite a bit. Um, Roland XP10 <laughs> workstation. I normally can't stand workstations, but there's a really nice orchestra sound on it, a really nice mm. um, electric piano. Actually, with the XP10, there's a really nice acoustic piano on it. On the last album, Deluxe 3, on um, the song uh, All Yesterday's Tomorrow's, um, I double tracked uh, on that song. I double tracked two Baldwin grand pianos, um, recorded them at Westland Studios in town here. Um, double tracked them. They they didn't sound like piano. They, to me, didn't sound like grand. That's, this does not sound like two double track grand pianos. So I had to use the piano on the XP10 yeah. on top of them, mix it into them to get them to sound like a sound like a piano. Yeah. Um, so, but nothing, um, what, one of the things I, I do use um, a lot and I highly recommend it and it was cheap and it's absolutely brilliant is uh, Novation Mini Nova. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I know the one, yeah, yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Wolfgang's got one as well. I mean, uh, you see them turning up everywhere, you know, but they're absolutely, basically the Mini Nova will do, will do everything. I mean, mm-hmm. you can do the whole do the whole lot on on a mini nova, and I, I tend to do that. Sometimes I pick one synth and maybe do the whole, well, my whole bits, you know, on on one synth. Um, just use different sounds, um, but no, no, nothing we do is we don't have any rules for anything. We just and that I think that's the beauty of it, and how we we always keep surprising ourselves because you never know where a where the idea is coming from, who it's coming from what it's going to be <laughs> and how it's going to turn out or how you're going to react to it. And even if you, re- you know, say I get an idea from Paula or Eugene or whatever, um, and I react to it in a certain way, once I pass it back, I don't know what way someone else is going to yeah, be. Exactly, yeah. You don't know what, you never know what you're going to get back. And it's a, ver- nobody I know that I've ever heard of actually works like this. So it's kind of nothing gets written off. Something comes up with an idea, you have to go with it and see what you can yeah. find it to kind of make it work rather than kind of, you know, I've been in bands before where an idea has been shot down because someone didn't feel it or whatever, only to come back to the same idea six months later and go, 
why didn't we work that up and put it on the bloody album? You know? Because so, we have a lot of stuff. Like we have a lot of songs written where we just kind of like sometimes everybody fires around the same time. It's like so we've a we've a lot more songs. That then, that is, right. Sometimes get shoved aside, don't they? And then it's like new album. We kind of just all like oh forget about those and we just start getting. Yeah, it's a uh, interesting way to work, but that's the way we work. So put on the album folders on the on the hard drive and say like <laughs> what ten tracks, eleven tracks on on deluxe debris, something like thirty tracks in the folder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Number ten of them were used, or ten of them were finished. Um, I same with every just every folder. There's about you know, in fact, I think on on um, Blue Wave, there's like about forty ideas. Yeah. In there. Um, but we only kind of worked up uh, nine of them. Yeah. So I know I know Blue Wave has just has just come out really, but I mean, it seems like you've got you've been really productive during the last year. So. It, have you got something else in the pipeline? And what's the what's the plan going forward? Are you going to release more material, or when you can get back out on the road? We've got a show coming up, uh, but we can't say too much about it um, at the moment. The big name remix. Some somebody uh, was very honoured. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, but we can't um, at this point. We can't say anything other than that. So um, the sleeves designed. <laughs> um, <laughs> We've got the, we're just waiting on Eugene's ambient uh, uh, mix of the track and that'll be it finished and we'll be ready to ready to go with it. Is that um, a new track or a remix from Blue Wave? It's a remix from, from one of the tracks from, from the album. Um, so, yeah, so we're quite excited about that and we were, you know, basically knocked out that this person uh, has done the remix. Um, okay. and, Amazing job. The remix done by a well-known London uh, English guy is very good as well. So we do two remixes and then it'll be... Whatever. Can we start playing Guess Who? No. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, guess who, eh? I'm not it's a big anything. secret. It's a big secret. We can't, but I'm looking forward to it. You will, you'll know pretty soon anyway, so... Have we yeah. mentioned the name already in this whole interview? Um, I've done. Oh. Oh. Or not. <laughs> 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 and then, shows, and, honestly, no, I, I don't think it's looking good for this year. Maybe October, yeah. November. We'd we'll probably do another live, one or two live streams. Yeah. I wouldn't say, certainly from an Irish point of view, it's not looking good. Yeah, we, we had, um, we were hoping to do the third uh, Unlocked in Live um, thing, but we were going to do it a bit special. We had an actual venue kind of lined up for it and everything. Um, and we'll have the, the just do it like an actual kind of live show. Yeah. Um, there was, yeah, it, it just the insurance, et cetera, et cetera, with the whole COVID thing. Um, yeah. Another idea we had was to do a kind of live show and invite about 100 people, but give them at the front door, give them hazmat suits and masks. To kind of, you know, I thought that would have been great, but then. Venue. You wouldn't be able to drink anything because you know you have to take your mask off and you're yeah. spreading COVID and everything. But um, you know, but, but we do have the, the the point of collapse album coming up, and you know, that's going to be that's definitely being released. It's not getting shelved like our lost album. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I saw the um, Blue Waves out on vinyl in April, May. Is yeah. that 100 yeah. copies or 300 copies? There's, um, I think it's two, 250 copies or something like that. Uh, we just decided to do a limited edition on, on Blue Vinyl um, because it's not a real record unless it's on vinyl. I agree. I agree. Uh, so for all our viewers out there, put your order in. <laughs> well, I mean, we've had this conversation before. I mean... I mean, when we're speaking to Atlas about it, he agrees with it that I we don't feel as if you own an album until you've got it on vinyl. 
One last right. final person. <laughs> Go, leave, leave now. <laughs> but there's something about there's something about vinyl that is kind of yeah. You know, tangible and you own it i mean cds are great and sound brilliantly but you know something kind of you know that small is not the same like sean was saying about looking for things on the the album sleeves and the you know yeah. i thought that it sounded a bit of a flicker so i'm like you know me guys i'm like listening to my like, sean's like jesus you're listening to the whole song i like listening to this part so i'm probably a bit in that respect so i don't be like Aah! for me so uh, <laughs> the whole thing finally you you have to put it on, you have to sit back, chill out, have a cup of tea, just take it all in. Sometimes I just five times. And it's, it's, a, it's, yeah. it's, a proper, it's a proper emotional engagement, isn't it, I think? It is indeed. It's tactile, it, as Eugene says, a tactile thing as well. You actually kind of take the thing out of the sleeve, whether it's a CD or an LP. I mean, you know, I, I love vinyl, but don't get me wrong, I, I did not mourn the death of vinyl. I mean, CD is good enough for me, the, fantastic. You know, it's a physical format as well, and, and, it, and it's great. I still think vinyl sounds better, but, you know, I, I, I was happy with either or, uh, but now vinyl's back, you know, okay. brilliant. Again, it's that whole thing where you take it out of the sleeve, you know, you put it on the turntable or you put it on the deck, and you you interact to get it going. I mean, you know, as opposed to lying on the sofa flicking through. Mm. But all, yeah, also the thing of vinyl. Sorry, who wrote the songs? Who produced it? Who did the artwork? Who do they thank you? You get you feel like you get to know a little bit more behind the music and the artist. So yeah, that is missing on just the, the demo yeah. stuff for sure. For me, maybe some maybe people aren't interested in it anymore. But I think if you really are into music. You do want to know a bit more about that. So that's definitely missed on. You, I mean, Eugene's correct. I mean, you might, with an album, like any form of art, is it is a, where that artist was at that time from start to finish, that body of songs is where they were at the time. Perhaps it's like an artist that had a, a period where he drew in a particular style. But you're making a commitment to put the vinyl on, to listen to that, turn it over to listen to you're making a commitment to listen to that body of work rather than with your eye your ipod flicking around and listening to the odds the odd songs when downloading first came out my my boss called me into his office and he said i've got this thing called itunes you can download any song so i said oh brilliant and he said um he said show me how to download so i said okay who do you want to download he said pink floyd so i said type in pink floyd he called up pink floyd and I said, which song do you want? And he's, he said, which one's the longest? Yes. <laughs> he, 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 wanted to get, he wanted to get his money's worth. So he wanted to pick. <laughs> not, I don't know about our echoes. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the song he liked. It's which is the song the longest. Oh, we want to get the word, his money's worth. <laughs> what a cheap kid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I agree. Yeah. 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 <laughs> He paid something like um, whatever it was, what a quid for Palatine Palm or something off Abbey Road, which is about a minute long or something. Like yeah, what well, a waste of money. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I've come full circle. I, like many, I've got rid of my vinyl, I regret it. And then I bought cassettes and then CDs. And Mark kept saying vinyl's coming back. And I said, no, if I go in, I'll go all in. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've gone all in. <laughs> um, my wife's complaining about the lump that's had gone from a few months ago. The mass on the lounge, and I'm gonna, uh, but I love it. I love it, and I'm so pleased that you guys uh, are bringing this out in on oh, blue. It's a great piece of work, and uh, you know, I think if, if anyone wants to get this out and get it on vinyl, order it now while, while you can because it's <coughs> numbers are limited. So it's uh, but yeah, yeah. Delight, looking forward to getting that. Really, Anne. thank you. Hopefully, hopefully, they'll all get there because uh, it probably should point it out at this stage that um, the stuff that we posted, um, and not. 17th of December is very slowly trickling through. They're, they arrived this morning, just in time. What did this? What did this? Did my, look, my signed one. Hey. Wow. My, mine wasn't signed, so, but yeah, someone's yeah, Mark, someone's I've, stuck I've, in there. Someone's I've got stuck one in. over on Mark. I got a signed one. <laughs> on the first one, which which is uh, on uh, return of uh, what label is it on? Is it on uh, this one? Is, on the back, is there, a, is there a little orange on the back? Yeah. Or is it... All right. 
because the original the original run of those um, we had uh, was on a label called Segway Navigation and Universal in the Far East. Um, and these are kind of really rare. And when we did the first uh, tour with OMD, we were in Liverpool and we had pressed up our own in the card wallet. But we had um, we found um, Susan, who um, does our, our videos. She had found um, 15 um, of the, the original pressings on, on the, the, the Digipacks. And uh, anyway, we're selling them at the merch and we have all the other ones, but we have a couple of these original Digipacks there. And some, some guy who said, oh, I'll have a first album, but can I have the, the Digipack rather than the, 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 the wallet version? And we went, yeah, okay. Um, so that's 10 pounds, please. Uh, and it goes, you're not curious to know why I want this one and not that one? They went, because you like Digipacks or something, or you kind of <laughs> I said no because these are going for sixty five quid on eBay. Like, oh, what? We sold about ten of them last night. <laughs> oh <laughs> my god! <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, no, I'll just I'll just go regular one. Clearly. So <laughs> uh, yeah, if you want one of the other ones, like fifty quid, it's cheaper than get it on eBay. <laughs> I'll have a look on eBay. Yeah. Yeah. Get it on eBay, yeah. yeah well, we've got we've got the vinyl coming. That's still coming, and uh... can't wait to see the the turquoise vinyl. We're just kind of waiting oh. on the test at the moment. So um, yeah, once that's all. <laughs> Is there one person that you would like to, I mean, you've had, where'd you go after Wolfgang Fleur? But I mean, is there someone that you'd like to um, record or write with? Alan Wilder for me. Yeah. Um, you have? Definitely. Most definitely. Well, for me, probably um, Brian, Brian Eno. Wow. Um, or uh, either Brian Eno or, get this, uh, Robert Plant. No, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll get that. The guy's so off kilter, you never know what he's going to do or what he's going to come up with, or how he would kind of react to, to what you're doing. So that's kind of, I kind of like these, you know, Robert Plant, they're kind of like true artists. Jarvis um, Cocker would be good on a TNP song as well. What's up? Jarvis Cocker would be good on a TNP song. Yeah. Yeah. That would, yeah. Actually, that would be, that would be good. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, there's, there's sometimes a. You, hear, you know, I mean, not that it would probably be. Sometimes you can hear somebody. Well, his um, his Jarvis album, his last album, yeah. is really good. Really good. Yeah. 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 It's really yeah. good. Excellent. Yeah. House music all night long is just. Yeah, it's just great. Track. That's very nice. The the only problem with that was um, I I was kind of kicking around. I'd been listening to it quite a bit and. Yeah, uh, I was kind of working on a new idea in the studio and I've been playing around with it. I spent a whole day on it. I'm sure I've heard this somewhere before. It's just, and it must have been about 3 a.m. I think I texted you, Paula, and I said, oh, it's house music all night long. I just remember, I, I just realized. The other version. All night long, I think it was my own idea. <laughs> it was, yeah, not lyrically, musically. Well, sure yeah. House music all night long. First of all, for it, it was the Jarvis one, so I was very confused. <laughs> mm. <laughs> So, Sean, you were you was on E G Records, wasn't you, with Eno at the same yeah. time as it? He, um, I think he just left, or he was still. I, I can't remember. It didn't get to kind of meet him or anything like that. Um, actually, didn't get to meet anybody. It's kind of an, an interesting, an interesting label. It's um, well for me, like getting into my own kind of. Hall of Fame because it's like Ken Crimson, Roxy Music, Brian Eno, Robert Fripp, Killing Joke, 
basically everybody that was cool in the in the UK, um, um, and you know, with the exception of all the, the heroes like Pesh Mode and Autovox and all that, but but um, it was just <laughs> it was the oddest kind of it was on the it's on the well it was on the King's Road. I don't know if it's still there. But um, it was like a, it was like a bank. I mean, they, they, they're all very posh as well, and they, they all kind of wore suits and ties and things like that. And <laughs> not very rock and roll, is it? <laughs> no, we went there, Andy. We went there because E and G, e, e G were interested in our band for a while. Oh right. And nothing, nothing came of it. But I'd we went. Hair, we, I'd, I'd kiss the car, I'd hair then. <laughs> but we went. We had a meeting in their office. We had a chat with some A and R guy in their office. But you're right. It was very bank like and very, very prim and proper. Yeah, it was. And it was kind of you know. I mean, you think of like all those those kind of like real flipping heavy bands like Ken Crimson and Killing Joke. Yeah, and hard, hard kind of off kilter. All those artists are and hard kind of they they did so much kind of oddball stuff. But they're in this kind of this stuffy, you know, coming to this have meetings yeah. in a stuffy office. I mean, even doing things like interviews, we had to bring the interviewer to EG and they have a room all set up and everything. And we got to go in and you had to do it in there. Couldn't be done a pub or anything like that. You had to go and sit in a sit in an office. <laughs> kind of like that kind of that kind of idea. It was kind of it was it was different. And the fact that all the kind of people in there were not what you would expect it to meet in the music industry it's quite refreshing actually because normally you'd be kind of you know there'd be somebody called saz or baz or maz or daz or whatever and it's all hey wow we're so fortunate to be working in this wacky record company in london but <laughs> what i don't care and then you find out that they're just completely corporate <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. EG was the other way. They looked completely corporate, but they were anything but. I mean, they had a, they had a great roster of uh, artists on, on EG Records. Yeah, I mean, as I mean, they, for me, it was my Hall of Fame. I was just, uh, I remember dancing on the pavement on the King's Road outside after signing the, signing the deal, um, kind of yeah. just jumping up and down. And this is, this is amazing. Then, two days later, I got a phone call from Virgin. <laughs> and, uh, I, well, why are you phoning me? <laughs> Um, well, EG goes through Virgin, and uh, I remember my stomach just churning. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know what kind of Virgin at the same time, so that was kind of yeah. yeah. But, but I mean, even when you look back at sort of the eighties or nineties, and the the amount of independence, the factories, the four ads, the mutes, and all that stuff. Now they've all been they've all been swallowed up by each other now. So now you've still got you just I suppose Universal and Mm. Yeah, just the big labels now, and um... I don't really miss the a lot of those. Newt obviously are, are a fantastic label. Mm. Newt are are great. Four AD since I don't think they've signed a non-American band since the Pixies. Yeah. Virtually everybody they sign is American. Um, they I don't think they are. They what I mean. I love Future Islands and everything, but that's about the only thing I kind of listen to on their label since the Pixies. Um, um, you know, but they th there's this whole myth about the kind of whole kind of indie label thing. Like the indie labels were down with the people and down with the the kids. Just the difference between, for me anyway, the difference between an indie label and a major label was that me, you know, being on the dole in in Belfast, I could get the head of NR of CBS. Or Sony or whatever or, or Virgin on the phone from a phone box in the center of Belfast with an indie label you couldn't get through to anybody unless you kind of knew Damon Albarn's cat or something like that you know or whatever or, or you had some connection with some celebrity then they would you know but you know that, that was a difference I, I mm. find it interesting where people were kind of pushing these kind of like groovy indie labels like they're yeah. You know, whereas I find the the opposite was true. I think I thought the majors were more accessible and more kind of more open to working class people. <laughs> and you, you never think that. It's good, it's interesting to hear, mate. Really interesting. Nobody's ever said it. I mean, I, I find it kind of odd because 
you know, that, that would have been kind of, well, it's my experience anyway, so a lot of people were kind of, you know, seriously, we, I, I remember when I was starting off doing this, tried to do the indie levels and everything, and you just couldn't get the head of ANR or anybody from ANR to talk to you on the phone. You couldn't get past the secretary, you know, and there was one, um, I think I ended up saying to him, I'm sorry, if I actually dialed MI5 by accident. I mean, how are they supposed to find new talent when you can't get through? It's yeah. bizarre, isn't it? What's your job? Find new talent. I don't take any calls. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go, yeah, tell him it's Jason Bourne and he wants to come in. Weird. It's just like... That's bizarre. You know, Absolutely bizarre. Jeez. So, um, yeah, but, you know... But you're in a good place now, mate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of, I mean, a, a lot of things, you know, where you're able to kind of control and look after um, your own kind of, your own output. Because, yeah. like, a lot of times you don't, um, when you're signed to a label... Um, it has obviously there's a lot of benefits of being signed to a label, especially being signed to a to a major label, um, where you know the, the first album might take you out on a major label, the second album might take you out on an indie label. They both sold, sold exactly the same amount, um, but you Google the the one that came out on the indie label, and you find nothing. You Google the one that came out on the major label, and there's like all over the place. So obviously there's kind of you know, the benefits um, of, of being on a label. And there's benefits of being on a cool indie label. You know, obviously there's there's certain labels that are great. Newt is obviously a, a fantastic record label. Um, I don't even know about any majors anymore because I think they're all just, I think they're all just one. I think they're all universal or something like that. Right, you're right. All yeah, I'll say they've merged. We had but, Parlophone. I don't know Parlophone anymore. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, it would have been a great label. Um, you know, up, you know, up until the 21st century or whatever, I don't know what's happened there. No, they're all kind of, they've all seemed to be corporate and gone that way. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of, I think it's kind of sad, really, because they've all, all these labels all had a, a kind of personality in themselves. They all signed certain kind of artists. Yeah. And you kind of knew, like, Island Records would sign kind of like a certain amount of really experimental kind of off-kilter artists, and you kind of were drawn to their roster. Like the ultra box stuff and the same for chrysalis um so but i mean it's all you know well there's a really good book i've just looked it up i've, I've got it but i haven't read it yet but it's called the final days of emi and it says uh the selling of the pig and it basically just lists the catalog of errors that happened with emi that yeah they went from this you know the beatles yeah. duran duran to literally gone but there's a chapter in there called Oobla the e bit da which which is just kind of a dig at the accountants running the running the place. So um uh, read the book, is it good? It's supposed to be brilliant. Okay. It's um That's totally my kind of book. I would read yeah. <laughs> and autobiographies that's kind of all they read so i'll send you a link it'll probably be easier but it's called the selling of the pig and it's supposed to be brilliant that that guy i won't mention his name took over he was a bean counter and he took over as the head of the company and he just thought he treat all the artists like they're like they're shoveling fries and mcdonald's you know and nice. you know absolutely no empathy towards or no kind of knowledge of what an artist is or what an artist does or how an artist works it's just i'm in charge i tell you what to do shifting um, units isn't it yeah you know it's just uh, you know amazing and that's that's why you know you kind of listen to a lot of stuff you, you know a, a lot of music that comes out and it's all done by i mean Okay, I don't want to beat this thing to death, but I'll not mention his name. But myself and Paula went along to a seminar with a certain producer of, of kind of modern pop records. And we sat there uh, all the way through the seminar. And it was just incredible um, listening to, you know, the sort of stuff that he had to deal with, um, with kind of modern kind of pop artists. There was one he said he um, recorded... 64 tracks of the lead vocal and Paula does it in one. Oh, stop. No. <laughs> and then we get her to do another one just so we can if we want a double track. You know, she does it in one go. Any singer I've ever worked with does it in one. This this oh, is I was saying four. Warm up. And then 64 tracks. I, I, I don't think yeah, I, I record the warm-up and use it. Right. But um, the 
there are 64 tracks of vocals. And I said, can the person not sing? And he said, no, it's in case the A&R person wants to change a word or get this, a syllable. Oh my God. Go, okay, so, I mean, how do you get someone to sing a song 64 times with any kind of feel or any kind of, I, I, I find it really, really bizarre, quite soul destroying as well. Yeah. And, and, and how uh, does the A on art man have an opinion on over someone's art? This, this is the thing. It's all kind of changed. Whereas, you know, what used to happen was the A and R person signed you, um, told you you're going to do great things, and then they quit two weeks after signing you, and somebody new comes along <laughs> who can't stand you. <laughs> yeah, I think because music is such an emotive thing, there's no room for a bean counter really. I know they've got to run a business, but they should just run the business, but let you do your stuff because you're the artist, right? It, yeah. it's just, it really annoys me. I mean, I work in the advertising industry and. I got to be careful. I say, but that 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 the same thing there though. You know, these these local marketing offices are ruled by the accountants in terms of you got to get it cheap, you got to do it at that price. It's like, well, let them do their job. Same as yeah. an artist and singer, right, or a keyboard player. Let them do what they're good at because it's an emotion. You can't be an accountant for that. There's no. It's got to be a less structure in it. If you get that's what makes somebody like Mute um, really good because they're with the artist and you know kind of if you're signed to mute that you know they're with you you know and that's that's kind of you know well so it you know that's what it seems from like from the outside kind of looking in you, you look at the artist and they all you know i mean depeche mode have been with them from this from the start you know i'm sure they got mega bucks you know yeah. off to them but um obviously they can you know because daniel miller obviously knows his stuff and he knows how to treat artists and he knows yeah. that you know the artists don't you know you sign an artist because you, you you like what they do Yeah, I mean that's that, that's what that's what's kind of lacking. But it's also um, the way all this is disseminated now. It's music is kind of like it's like a kind of background noise. It's a constant. Uh, I mean, I, I know people just have it on the background all the time. And I go like, can we turn this up? I mean, I, I'm a musician and I don't need music in the background all all the time. You know, it's just like everybody kind of and it's just you go into a room there and it's all the music playing all the time. And it's just, it's just like flipping traffic noise after a while. Yeah, it's just, to, to me, it's not a background thing. I mean, you know, I, I, I remember studying for my, for my A-levels and I thought, I've got to put some music on to kind of study too. And I think, yeah, anything's going to distract me. So what's going to be the thing will probably, you know, I'm always kind of putting a hour long Klaus Schultz album on because I thought it would be the least intrusive thing. And I, I lasted two minutes, and I found myself listening to <laughs> as well as an actually kind of. So, uh, well, I've so, classical music on a lot, but I mean, that's from going in and out of the kitchen places. I do have that on low pretty much the whole day. But again, it's not something you can get distracted by the lyrics and stuff. But I would, I would have that on yeah, all yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. I find it quite soothing, though. So I do. I haven't say when you toured with. Oh, I'm dear, I'm major. When you come back, you just listen to the music so differently because you hear it live and yeah, yeah. yeah. things behind it. So that that's kind of really, really odd. <laughs> One of the things I find is that that um, growing up with those songs like um, you know, Joan of Arc, etc., um, you had you had a certain kind of image in your head or a certain feeling towards them. Um, but once you've done kind of two tours with them. Um, when you hear those songs now, it's not kind of making me feel like when I was a teenager and kind of hearing these things for the first time or was at school. It's taking me back to, oh, I remember that sound check in Dresden or whatever. Yeah. And it's it's kind of it's kind of weird. It's kind of moved it. Um, yeah. It's kind of, yeah, and there's no actually what's kind of interesting and what's actually really good about those things is that there's no 
well, for me anyway, there's no nostalgia thing to them. I don't really like nostalgia and I've never really been into it. Um, and, you know, so I can listen to Scary Monsters by Bowie and it's not taking me back to being at school or anything like that. It's just, it's Scary Monsters by Bowie. It's kind of, it's here and now, but after I think that's my favourite Bowie album, I think. Same, yeah. Scary Monsters. Very nice. I think Low is probably mine. Low is mine, for, for sure. Yeah. yeah. yeah Low is great. Follow. Just because of side two. I just love it. The Berlin Bowie is my favourite anyway, so just, that was my favourite. Yeah, it's, it's a great shout. It's a great album. Talking about Bowie in, in, in Berlin here, and Paula hasn't mentioned Hansa yet. <laughs> <laughs> you, you keep talking there, Sean. <laughs> yeah, we actually, we were, um, uh, when we were in Berlin with OND, um, the, the second uh, gig at the Temple Drum, uh, we had a day off and we went uh, we went to Hansa um, and we did the tour, which was absolutely wow. amazing. It was kind of just to be in that kind of space. It's like almost like um, we didn't get into Clang Clang. We were outside Clang Clang. We were in Dusseldorf. But it's like for us to be in that kind of Hansa space, the Pesh Mode, Bowie. Yeah, exactly. Dream, Tangerine Dream, of which there are no pictures on the wall. I was quite surprised. Um, all, all these, all this amazing, incredible music that had been through that, and we we were in the studio, and there was the the piano, the the Steinway that um, Bowie and Alan Wilder and all had played, and uh, the guy doing the tour said, "Oh, are there any musicians here?" And he lifted the lid up of the piano, and um, I just went down, I just sat sat down and started playing. Um, we shine, which is the first thing that came into my head. And Paula starts singing, singing along with it. And um, the moment the, the hairs on the back of my neck just stood up. Did someone record it on their phone or anything? Or? No, you weren't allowed. But somebody said something really nice. And they said, um, "Just think, um, your music is you, the the walls are now forever imbued with your music." Wow. Uh, wow. That's. You know, I mean, I, I, I think about, you know, you, you talked about some of the founding fathers like Andy and Paul for OND, Wolfgang for these guys have, you know, Chris Payne really, yeah. you know, they've given you guys so much validation. It must give you a massive sense of pride and achievement. It's uh, like you have to pinch, like personally, you have to pinch yourself and go, you know, being on stage in London with Chris Payne doing Fade to Grey. Um, Wolfgang Floor on your album, and uh, yeah. you're on the stage with OMG. Like oh, I'm still, still, I'm, still I'm, a, I'm a fan boy. I brought uh, Architecture Morality up for the guys to sign, and they were yeah. going, Is "This your copy?" And I went, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And they were going, "Oh," and, and signed away. But I was in the queue, so yeah. yeah. For uh, Midge uh, sharing the stage and hearing, um, I, I would never got a chance to hear, uh, you know. Vienna live, but to be on that tour and he did Vienna, amazing. Yeah, oh, yeah. that was on. That was on the. Uh, was that the Vienna? The Vienna eighty. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we saw we saw that show at the Palladium, but you, you guys weren't supporting there. Rusty Eagle. No, was doing Rusty, the DJ. Rusty was doing oh, I was there, but I didn't. I was just meeting the. Oh, uh, you? I was being introduced to them. Yeah, I was there just for a while, and then no, we weren't on that one. We joined, I think. He's quite entertaining, Rusty, in that little yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm amazed he kept it a half an hour, though, bless him. <laughs> a bit like Sean. Yeah. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. He's a, he's, I love yeah. Rusty. He's a proper force. And, totally. Uh, All yeah. of yeah. personality. Yeah. And I've got to thank you for music. So, so like we trying to find bands for people. He's done that for, I mean, God, he used to have that Twitch TV show. And I, I said to him, I love it, but I hate it. He said, what do you mean you hate it? I said, because every album I hear or track, I go, I'll go and buy that on vinyl and I've bought five albums by the end of the show. It's like... He's, he's been such a help to us. Like, mm. oh, yeah. Never in the set, and he's just a really nice, helpful guy, you know? Yeah, he's yeah. He's a character. Like, so, when we met in 2015 and he came to see us in London, um, I ha I had an idea that he was there to see us and, you know, and then he he's the one that got us to Dusseldorf. He's the one that's got us, like... We owe so much to Rusty. We really, yeah. really, really yeah. 
doesn't he? he just really believes in some act. Yeah, he's been really well. He's come on our show in the beginning. We've done an interview session with him. He was our first proper interview we did. Uh, um, uh, yeah, he's, he's been and he's been very um, helpful to us. So yeah. Well, we, before before the Palladium show, we we had dinner with Rossi, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. So then he left us, and then he did his DJ thing, and then we did. Then we, I mean, we know him a little bit. I mean, Andy knows him a little bit more, but we we did the interview with Rossi, and it he talked for five hours. <laughs> Getting a run for money there. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We did. We put it put into three shows, but it was uh, it was great. And uh, yeah, you're right. He's uh, his brain just is incredible. It just he knows it. everyone. He's been been everywhere. He's you're seen every, seen thing. everything. He's he's an incredible guy. Incredible. I'll tell you one of the things he did, and uh, it was like it was amazing. We um, the first time I, I, um, I think it was the, the first time I met him. Uh, was myself and Una picked them up from Dublin Airport. Um, Spando Ballet were playing a, a normal drum here in Dublin. And yeah. uh, Rusty was um, DJing beforehand. And uh, myself and Una picked them up from, well, Una picked them up. I was in the passenger seat, <laughs> picked them up from the airport. Uh, we went to the, the Spando Ballet um, show, watched him doing his, um, did his set, and he dropped um, Control Me into the set. Like, from like the thirty thousand people or whatever, which was which was brilliant. And then um, backstage, we, we went to the kind of the, the, the green room, um, massive big, a normal drum. Um, and then he gets a phone call, uh, and this is about um, three a.m. <laughs> he gets a phone call, and there's a place in town called Lily's Bordello. I don't know, I think it's probably gone, but it's just kind of like one of these after show places where all the celebs go to. And he got a call saying that the, the, the DJ was kind of like basically not. Would he be, would he be interested in coming along and doing a set? So we all kind of went along to to the Lilies um, with him. Uh, 3 a.m. There was like two, three people on the dance floor when this other DJ was playing. Yeah. And um, Rusty kind of took over. Um, within about, you know, 10, 15 minutes, the, flipping, the floor was rammed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just kind of interesting to see him kind of like yeah. the first time he met him and you kind of look at it going, wow, this guy really knows his, he really knows his stuff. He really knows how to get a crowd on the crowd on the floor. Well, I, and equally, I mean, he was like the heart of the storm, the new romantics, the Blitz Club, all that that stuff. I mean, and he, I, I saw the Spandau Ballet show and he did the DJ set. Just, just yeah. the way he does the music, it's mm. just brilliant. It was better than... Yeah, you know, having a support act, having having Rusty there, got everyone in the in the mood, and like you exactly. said, on the dance floor is incredible, incredible chat. But one of the thing, uh, the thing that that I I love about him is as well that his enthusiasm hasn't dulled uh, one iota. You know, it's just he's still he's still got this enthusiasm, and you know, I think that's what's keeping all, all these kind of people going and, and doing kind of great stuff like with um with OMD as well, you can tell they're still vibed up by the music. They still love it. I mean, um, Rusty's like that as well. You just get this complete kind of, it's like being a kind of teenager again when you're around them, we're kind of talking about music. And I, I will never forget whenever um, that show that, that Eugene mentioned um, in Dusseldorf, um, we ended up opening for Michael Rother, which wow. was unbelievable. And, um, after um, Andy missed our set, but uh, once once uh, Rother came on stage, uh, we had a brief chat with Andy kind of before, and we just met him for the first time. And then the next thing, myself and Eugene are watching Michael Rother. The next thing, I feel his hand on my shoulder, and I turn around, and it's Andy McCloskey going, "Yes, he's playing this tra- this noise track. I didn't think he was going to be doing this." <laughs> I get really kind of excited, and again, it was just like being back at school for me. <laughs> And I like being at a gig, you know, in the Ulster Hall when you're seeing these people for the first time. And it's just this kind of like mad kind of childlike kind of enthusiasm. And, and it's great. And that's why they're still, they're all still producing great work because there's nobody mm-hmm. seems to be jaded or, or anything like that. You know, it's just like even meeting Gary Newman as well. You know, it's like, it's great, all these people. And they're just very ordinary kind of. Yeah. Kind of. Well adjusted people from what from what I can see anyway. <laughs> just like you guys. Just normal people. It's great. 
be passionate about what you do. Um, yeah. That's 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 what spurs everyone on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, age is just a number. I mean, we mentioned John Fox earlier. I mean, he's probably is he, he must be close to seventy now. But my God, that album he did last year. He doesn't, he doesn't sound like he's close to seventy. No, no, yeah. and, no. And that album is just you know, if you, I think age is just a number. If it burns inside you, that passion for music and that creativity, doesn't matter how old you are. You know, you just keep yeah. doing it. Right? Exactly. Guys, thank you very much for spending well, your Saturday you. night with us. Yeah, it's been amazing. Um, we, we love what you're doing. We love the latest album, especially, and we'll we'll do our bit with the show, and we'll plug your music and get it out there. But I mean, we really, really appreciate you taking the time, and uh... appreciate it. Oh, honestly, guys, and can't wait to see you when you're touring. We'll be at the front of the queue. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'd be nice. It's nice to actually buy you a beer and say thank you properly, and. Uh, okay. We'll buy you. No, no, we'll get you one. No, no, we'll get us. We'll buy each other one. (laughs) Then we get then we get two each. (laughs) Right, actually we get more, Andy, because there's three of them. There's two of us. It's probably the most amazing about this interview was you just spoke to three people in Dublin and there wasn't a single expletive uttered. When we hang up, when we hang up, you'll be swearing away. Get get the last get the last hour's worth of expletive out of the way. Yeah, those yeah. two ethics geezers, what the hell were they talking about? <laughs> no, it's been lovely to meet you guys and uh, been an absolute joy. And again, as Mark said, thank you. It means a lot to us. It's been brilliant. Loved it. More importantly, I can't wait to see you guys live again. Oh, thank you yeah. so much. And the new material as well. I mean, that's going to be uh, that's going to be really worth waiting for. The weird thing about that, about that album was we, we were actually... Um, playing some of it live uh, whenever we toured in the UK, um, get our headline tours in the UK. We actually played a few tracks from it live, and people were asking, Oh, are they going to be on the new album? <laughs> so, so, the new album, we haven't used any of the point of collapse, completely new album was all written um, in lockdown, and that's that's why there's nine tracks on it because they were the tracks that we wrote during lockdown. Um, but yeah, it's funny to kind of play. You know, people were expecting to hear French cinema or sexy chuck or whatever uh, on the new album, and they're not there. But obviously, we we look forward to the mystery remix as well, which is oh yeah, which is imminent. Yeah, yeah. We, we'll be announcing it in the next couple of weeks. Excellent Maybe. stuff. Uh, Excellent stuff. We're just getting it all getting it all ready, or whatever. So um, actually, it's a good job we're in lockdown because. The amount of work that we've had to do with these things has been like a full-time job. Um, kind of getting all the the album done, getting it all prepped, um, getting yeah. it designed and getting it ready has been, you know, it's been a lot of work. And um, Una has been doing a lot of sterling kind of work in the background and things. So there's yeah. getting views, et cetera, sort of out. So hopefully it'll, um, yeah, it'll continue to uh, grow. So welcome to our Hot Stuff section, um, where Mark and I look at some great new albums that your ears really should be listening to. Um, And in this particular episode, I've got two absolute belters for you. Uh, The first album is lovingly titled Charismatic Megafauna by the brilliant Simon Spine. It's their second LP. They hail out of New York. Um, Their sound kind of mixes woozy psychedelia, um, sort of funky bass lines, um, electronica and earth real melodies. There's elements of techno and disco that kind of weave their way into their fairly experimental sort of left field pop sound. Um, this is really on the money for fans of Unknown Mortal Orchestra, LCD Sound System, Talking Heads, big taming parlor feel in this album as well. But I think despite those influences, you make no mistake, they have their own sound and I would thoroughly recommend this. I posted one of the tracks 
on our Facebook page and you got you know, really good feedback and the video is fantastic. I think the, the um, track's called Jump Rope. Yeah, love it. It's the full track on the album. But yeah, definitely one to recommend. It is an absolute grower and um, yeah, it's full of great surprises. So treat yourself to this if you can. As I say, it's a uh, charismatic megafauna by the brilliant Simon Spine. <laughs> And my second album I want to recommend for our Hot Stuff section is an absolute belter, and it's by the mighty Schiller and the new album, uh, Summer in Berlin. Um, David Bowie once said that um, Berlin, the greatest cultural um, extravaganza that one could imagine. Um, this guy, Christopher von Damen, he kind of likes to think outside the box, do the opposite of what most musicians might do. He's been doing this for over two decades. Um, he's, he sort of operates in his own parameters, um, and even completely tries to buck the trend. Uh, he's an advocate of alternatives. Um, he likes new approaches and rethinking electronic pop music. He's one that doesn't want to surrender to the consensus at any price. Um, he's always looking for new ways, um, and with all the uncompromising attitude if necessary. Um, he demonstrates with this a project of cultivated contrast, aesthetic breaks, and elegant contradictions. Um, I think Schiller loves the kind of opulence, this sort of extra length and cinema that's been going on in the head. He opens the curtain for this album with the Clang des Stratt, which alone defies every common radio or streaming format with its length of over 20 minutes. But every minute is an absolute joy. It's an impressive example of his consistent sort of modus operandi, which fits seamlessly into Schiller's work of art. Adaption, not for this guy. I have to say, I've loved this guy's work for some time and he never, ever under delivers. But this album ticks every box, and I mean every box. Melodic, creative, orchestral, anthemic, inspiring, emotional. It really is like a synth pop dream of ultimate perfection. This for me is already a contender for albums of the, the albums for 2021. Trust me. Absolute vital addition to your vinyl collection. Um, please check this out. Um, it's faultless. Okay, both of my Hot Stuff choices are not brand new releases, but both qualify as Hot Stuff choices that need checking out by you guys. So, my first Hot Stuff album choice is the Claudia Brooken Jerome Throws album Begin, released in 2018. Two icons of electronic music who teamed up for a collaborative project and the results are something extraordinary. Begin is the fusion of the talents of Claudia Brooken famously the lead vocalist of German avant-garde pop group Propaganda, and Jerome Froese, the son of electronic music pioneer and Tangerine Dream founder Edgar Froese. The album contains the pulsing soundscapes that you would expect with a Tangerine Dream record, with Brooken's unmistakable and unique voice. However, there's more. Begin is a bit of a curveball, in that it's really not what you'd expect, considering the backgrounds of the two artists. If you approached it just expecting a Tangerine Dream album fronted with the icy propaganda vocals, then you may be surprised. With a couple of exceptions, this is a downbeat album that is full of beautifully produced ethereal and atmospheric music, full of, full of synthetic textures, but there's so many other sonic elements too. You should really check it out for yourself. It's a beautiful record and give your ears a treat. You won't be disappointed. My 
second Hot Stuff album choice is Valley Heart, the third and final album from the Californian band She Wants Revenge, released in 2011. She Wants Revenge influences are both clearly from New York and from England. They are a band that are brooding and slick. Their sound has a touch of Interpol, a touch of psychedelic furs, a touch of white lies, and there's a little bit of Bowie chucked in there too. And why not? The third album is their most accessible to date and it has a dark, gritty electronic sounds, programmed beats that are pushed to the fore. The band toured extensively through 2006 with both Depeche Mode and Placebo. So if you like your simps gloomy, you should check this album out. In 2012, the band announced that they were taking an indefinite hiatus and in 2020, the band announced that they were disbanding altogether. If you've not heard them, go give this a spin. As it's a good starting point to discover she wants revenge. After taken like thieves and leave a disaster, make believe love it always comes and goes too fast. So that's it for this episode of the Electronic Cafe. I hope you enjoyed the hot stuff section that Mark and I brought to you in this episode. Um, I certainly love the two albums I put forward. Um, and again, I just hope you enjoyed uh, our amazing interview with the wonderful Tiny Magnetic Pets. Again, a big thank you to Paul and Sean and Eugene for your time uh, and for your conversation. It was brilliant. Um, and I can't wait to see you guys live uh, when the when we're allowed to so yeah that'd be great um but look out for some more amazing interviews coming this year mark and i are getting some very good confirmations which i will share with you uh sometime soon um if you haven't subscribed to this show please do we're all about bringing great music to people that love uh just very cool music so please if you haven't subscribed as i said please do hit that subscribe button that's it from me uh, look forward to seeing you next time on the electronic cafe bye bye for now Thanks for watching the Electronic Cafe and for your continued support. Thank you also to the Tiny Magnetic Pets, great people, and please take care and we'll see you again soon. Bye.